Hello to everyone. A very warm uh, welcome from me. I'm uh, Luciano Sazo. I'm a professor of the Faculty of Pharmacy and Medicine of uh, Sapienza University of Rome in Italy. And I'm very proud to be uh, together with uh, Professor Frank Rulli, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Zurich, Ambassador of the European Office of the Association of Academic Health Centers International. I would like to thank uh, very much Frank uh, for uh, working uh, uh, very well for this office together with me and together with uh, Nicole Bender, the manager of the office, uh, to organize uh, this uh, series of webinars that we would like to launch uh, in the year 2022-2023 in view of uh, the in-person meeting that we are planning for September 2023 in Zurich. So we really would like to have uh, several participants from Europe and from the rest of the world uh, in this series of uh, webinars organized by the association. As you know, the uh, European office was established in Zurich uh, only in July, and uh, we are starting a plan of activities, you know, to try to really involve uh, many institutions in Europe in cooperation with other uh, institutions in the US and in the rest of the world. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, at this webinar and to uh, open, uh, uh, you know, this the floor uh, to the webinar entitled uh, The Parameter Recommendations Adopting uh, Best Practices in Personalized Medicine Research. I would like to thank uh, very much uh, Christine uh, Carl Smith, the Director of the Association of Academic Health Centers International, Afril uh, De Goma, se Senior Program Specialist, uh, the same association, and Abiga Bel Belgedi. I would like also to thank uh, all the distinguished speakers for having accepted our invitation and all participants for being online with us uh, today. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the first speaker. The first speaker is uh, Jacques Demotz, uh, is a Director General of the European Clinical Research Infrastructure Network, uh, ECRIN, based in Paris, in France, which uh, he founded in 2004. In this role, uh, Jacques is responsible for the strategy and overall management of the infrastructure with the support of the ECRIN Management Office and the ECRIN Scientific Partners. Jack is a neurologist and professor of cell biology and an advisor to the Biology and Health Research Department at the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research. While at ECRIN, he has contributed to numerous initiatives and collaborative projects related to multinational clinical trials. In particular, he chaired the working group that drafted the recommendation on the governance of clinical trials of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, OECD. So without further ado, uh, Jacques, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luciano. And thank you for this, this invitation. I think for us, it's really a great opportunity to discuss with you and to disseminate the outcome of the permit project. So I will share my slides. Um, I guess you can see my slides now. So um, this webinar is based on the outcome of a project uh, funded by the Horizon 2020 uh, program of the European Commission called PERMIT, which is about the method in personalized medicine research. Um, the, the project started for a very simple reason. A few years ago, I was involved in the evaluation panel of a, a funding call for personalized medicine research. And it turned out that um, there was no clear consensus regarding the um, acceptable methods for personalized medicine. And so based on this, I, di I discussed with, uh, with colleagues and we came to uh, establishing a research consortium to address the issue of the methodological standard for personalized medicine research. So the consortium is composed of research infrastructure like BBMRI, the European Research Infrastructure for Biobanking, Elixir, which is the European Research Infrastructure for Bioinformatics, EATRIS, the European Research Infrastructure for Translational Research, and ECRIN, the one for, for clinical trials. And besides the research infrastructure, there are also scientific experts and scientific institutions, investigators. We have involved also 
participation from uh, patient association we have involved and this is very important the regulator both the EMA and the CTCG which is the clinical trial coordination group putting together all the national competent authority the ethics committee the HTAs data protection expert the industry funding bodies and very importantly also the journal editors because all these stakeholders have a strong interest in establishing a methodological standard and uh, trying to understand what is acceptable what is reliable what is robust enough in terms of personalized medicine research and based on this consortium we were able to develop the project so the project considers that there is more or less three main steps in the development of personalized medicine. The first one, which is the stratification step, the second one, the translational step, and the third one, the clinical trial step. So the stratification step is the more complex because it starts usually with observational studies, with cohort, stratification cohort, validation cohort, test cohort. And during this um, observational study, not only the data, but the biosample are collected, the omics data generated through different sort of devices they are put together in multimodal data management instrument. And then the stratification is performed either through conventional method or through machine learning method. So this is the more complex steps. And then after that, there is another important step, which is a translational step during which uh, the, the, the objective is to uh, attempt to recapitulate the stratification through animal model, cellular model, organoid model, or whatever model. And then the third step is a clinical trial step. First of all, to compare the, um, the treatment assigned to each subcluster versus the control, but also to compare the personalized versus the non-personalized approach. Based on this, uh, the project is composed of four main uh, objectives. The first one was to perform a scoping review of the methods used in the published paper. The second one is to, to, to provide methodological recommendation. The third one is to explore the regulatory ecosystem, which is a very complex one. And then all this is transposed into training material and you are the, the target for this training material today. So I will now just mention that uh, this resulted in a series of publications. Now we have five papers published, but this is an ongoing process and we still have a few papers to be published to, uh, to, to, to report on the outcome of the project. And this is what will be now presented by our colleagues. Thank you for your attention. And I give the floor now to Rita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacques, also for your uh, very uh, efficient and uh, brief presentation, but very, very clear. So thank you. So now it's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker is uh, Rita Banzi. She is a uh, head of the Center for uh, Health Regulatory Policies at the Instituto di Ricerche Farmacologiche Mario Negri in Italy. Uh, Rita has a doctoral degree in pharmaceutical sciences uh, and the postgraduate specialization in clinical pharmacology. Uh, she's the head of uh, the Center for Health Regulatory Policies uh, at the Mario Negri Institute. Her main fields of expertise are uh, drug regulatory policies, health research, methodology and ethics, uh, evidence synthesis, uh, data sharing and transparency research. She runs a critical analysis of the pharma legislation and regulation at the European level. She supports uh, several clinical investigators and research networks in the setup of clinical projects, systematic reviews, and the HTA reports. She teaches in uh, postgraduate training programs on clinical research methodology, systematic reviews, and clinical guidelines at the University of Milan and the University of Modern and Reggio Emilia. She is also a member of the Cochrane. Uh, and uh, um, she was member of the panel of the 23rd WHO Expert Committee on the Selection and Use of Essential Medicine. Thank you, Rita. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Sasso, and uh, thanks for this kind invitation. I will now share my screen. Hopefully, everything will go smoothly. Okay. Um, 
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, my task today will be to uh, drive you through uh, the methodology we applied uh, in the permit project to develop uh, the recommendation that my colleagues will uh, um, discuss and present you uh, later on today. Uh, the methodological framework we applied uh, in the project was aimed to um, balance between uh, uh, two different forces. The first one was the idea to have a common and harmonized process uh, um, in the four groups uh, that has uh, worked uh, in uh, the development of the recommendation, but also to take into consideration the specificities and the differences uh, of the various steps uh, um, that we identified in a classical uh, personalized medicine program uh, a pipeline, as um, Jacques was mentioning uh, before. Um, this is more or less the structure of the common methodological framework. Uh, uh, the process lasted about uh, two, hour, two years and a half. Uh, we started uh, with uh, the collection of the background information and that was used in the development phase and in the finalization phase uh, in order to develop the uh, permit recommendations. The last um, phase uh, was the was the so-called implementation phase, where, where um, the um, output of this uh, process I will outline you uh, briefly in the next slides uh, was discussed and uh, uh, presented to the different stakeholders that might be interested in personalized medicine and personalized medicine research. <laughs> Um, without going into the details, uh, this is, is the this is the illustration of the permit methodology. But let's have a look, uh, a closer look to each of these four steps. Um, the first step uh, was the so-called uh, collection of background information. The goal was really to map the concept of uh, methods applied uh, in uh, research uh, under the uh, wide and, and broad umbrella of the personalized medicine. Uh, the first obstacle, of course, was uh, to find a common definition for personalized medicine, which, which was not trivial and it is not trivial at all. And um, the second goal was to describe uh, what was already available in terms of methodological practice and standards in the various steps of personalized medicine programs. And uh, also to identify possible gaps and uh, possible areas where um, there was a major need for methodological guidelines. In terms of methodology, this step was based on the development of scoping reviews. Um, these four scoping reviews uh, share the common review protocol and with uh, some adaptation that were um, needed to account for the specificity of the different uh, parts of the project. Um, the, the reviews were conducted by four review teams uh, um, composed by um, contact expertise, people with a, a specific expertise in, the, in that given field and supported by method teams and of course uh, coordinated by the project, the permit project coordination. Um, just briefly, why we chose to uh, uh, use scoping reviews. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, um, scoping reviews are a type of literature, uh, secondary literature review uh, that respond to the broad question, what has been already done or published around a given field. And uh, thought it, um, scoping reviews share uh, some of the um, rigid methodology of systematic reviews, they are uh, more um, adequate to explore uh, heterogeneous and uh, complex fields uh, such as the one of uh, personalized medicine. If you are interested in uh, knowing more about the methodology of scoping reviews, uh, I just put here some important references you may uh, wish to uh, read and, and, and see. Uh, before the starting of the conduction of the four um, scoping reviews, we published uh, the common proto protocol in the open access repository uh, Zenodo um, in order to increase the transparency and the robustness of our methodology and to let people knowing uh, what were our plans. 
Uh, Jacques already mentioned some of the publication. These are the four uh, um, scoping reviews that were published uh, in 2021, 2022. They are all on uh, open access journals, so you can have uh, a look and get some more details uh, by the publication, but I'm sure my colleagues will also give uh, some brief uh, uh, um, summary of the results of these publications. The second phase was the development phase, and the goal here was really to discuss and, and, and exchange ideas on the standards and the gaps uh, that were needed for uh, development, the guidelines, and uh, really to set the basis for drafting the recommendations. Uh, the methodology was quite easy here. We conducted a series of working sessions and larger workshops. Uh, um, involving uh, both uh, the members of the permit consortium, but also external field experts that were identified uh, uh, for each of uh, the groups uh, involved in this exercise. And it became clear very soon that some of the questions were uh, transversal and were common to different groups. So we also organized some uh, so-called joint meetings uh, across different groups. Uh, just as an example, uh, we wanted to um, really explore the issue of how to estimate correctly the sample size for cohort studies or for um, uh, artificial intelligence exercise applied to precision medicines. The third phase was the so-called finalization phase, where um, on the basis of the information collected from the scoping reviews and the discussion in the development phase, the group really uh, translated all this discussion into actionable and uh, applicable recommendations. Here, the groups followed slightly different approaches depending on, on, on the context. Uh, um, some yeah, applied a more formal um, agreement process such as a Delphi exercise, and other applied uh, a kind of collaborative writing on shared documents to develop and finalize uh, the set of recommendations. And again, here, um, both people in, in, in the permanent consor consortium and expert uh, in the fields were uh, involved. The last phase was the implementation phase. As you know, uh, developing recommendation by itself is not enough uh, to be sure that this recommendation will be then spread and possibly used in practice. So we uh, engaged uh, um, different end users, different stakeholders with a, with a an interest in personalized medicine and personalized medicine research in order to identify the best approaches for dissemination and implementation, and also to identify uh, training needs uh, for the different groups. Uh, the methodology was um, uh, the organization of a joint meeting with all the different stakeholders we identified uh, um, in, in the field, um, for instance, uh, people working in uh, health technology assessment agencies, uh, patients' representatives, uh, of course, uh, scientific journals and, and publisher, regulators, uh, policymakers, and, and, and funders of research with, uh, who are very important in this uh, context. This was uh, my quick overview of the methodological approach applied to the development of the permit recommendations. Uh, um, just to summarize, uh, uh, we um, built a common framework with some degree of flexibility to account for the complexity of, uh, of the project. Uh, we involved um, both uh, consortium members and external field experts in order to uh, allow a broader view on, uh, on, the, on the process and on, on, on our outputs. Uh, and we uh, try to get as much as possible feedbacks uh, from uh, uh, the people and the stakeholder groups uh, that will eventually uh, use our recommendation in their own uh, uh, daily activities. I'm quite sure that you will get uh, many more details in the next presentation, but uh, for me it's uh, uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rita, very clear. 
So we proceed now with the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Judith Subirana Mirete. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the Park Sanitari San Joan de Deo in Barcelona and associate professor at the University Autonoma de Barcelona. Judith completed her PhD in uh, 2016 in the field of the assessment of cognitive impairment, focusing on the importance of cognitive uh, processing speed. She has focused her formation in neuropsychology and neurosciences, accomplishing her specialization in neuropsychology in 2010 at the University Autónoma de Barcelona. Her research spans uh, different areas, including the early detection and evaluation of cognitive impairments and dementia. She has published in this field uh, several articles and also four book chapters. Judith, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stasso. Okay, I'll try to share my screen with all of you. Hope you can see it properly. Um, thank you for your introduction, Professor Sasso. Uh, in the next minutes, I will be introducing you a little bit on what was our work on methods for data collection, quality and design of stratification and validation cohorts in throughout the permit project. And as my colleague Rita has introduced uh, just in the previous presentation, the methodology of our project was a little bit complex, but it was well structured. We worked on the initial stage of the project and our main objective was to define which were the methodological guidelines for the design of a stratification and validation of cohorts while trying trying to ensure data quality in projects related to personalized medicine. And we focused on different topics, mainly on issues related to sample size and statistical power, the nature and amount of data that should be collected per patient, and also on the real reliability of the data that we needed in our studies. And how we did that? Well, Rita has introduced us a little bit on, on this topic, but we try to identify which were the main gaps on stratification and validation, and as well as, as well as on sample size calculation. And from that on, we try to establish some methodological guidelines to fit these gaps and in the following slides, I will try to give you a little bit more of information on how we did that. During uh, our review of literature, we could identify a lack of standards and guidelines in personalized medicine in four different levels. The first one was on how to calculate sample size. Another one was which prerequisites and methods should be used when integrating multiple cohorts, and also how to work properly on quality of data of, and which were the requirements that were needed to monitor the collection of data that was obtained in our studies. Those gaps could be grouped into two main different or big topics. The first one was obvious, was sample size, and the other three were grouped as gaps in cohort design. We now had already identified our gaps, as Rita told us before, um, due to all this literature review and all this systematic review, but we needed to land them as challenges and also as recommendations. So how we did that? Well, as we, as Rita has told us before, we consulted the experts. From the previous scoping review, we contacted with uh, some of the best experts in these fields. They were experts on personalized medicine, on methodology, 
biomarker studies and clinical trials and in a great amount of um, areas of expertise. And all this expertise was needed to be summed up in order to get with the best answers to fill in those gaps we had found previously in literature and with all the information that was collected in the two workshops that we made, we went uh, through an Delphi process in order to try to get the ideas implemented as guidelines and as recommendations. So I won't take much time explaining the process as it has been explained before, but if you are interested in a more detailed uh, um, phases of our process, just please don't, don't hesitate in asking me or in contacting me afterwards. So let's see the interesting part of our projects, which are the results. After the two workshops and the two round Delphi process, we had a great number of recommendations, which we had to group together according with the two blocks that were previously defined, sample size gaps or those recommendations that could fit those sample size gaps and those recommendations that could fit our cohort design gaps. On sample size calculation, we could uh, find just like 10, 12 recommendations that were made for, from our experts. Nine were based on basic elements of sample size calculation. One was made uh, regarding a study intention and two more regarding the study design. Okay, let's see some of them. Um, the first issue that was discussed with our experts was the fact that we had to consider some factors when calculating sample size. Some examples of factors that experts discussed about are in the screen. And for example, we discussed about the kind of data that was needed or, what, or which was better used the type of target population, or if the aim of the study should be diagnostic or should be prognostic. And the second interesting conclusion that we reached was that the use of pilot data and simulations is useful to estimate suitable sample sizes for different settings and for different study goals. Those had also to be in accordance with the objectives of our study. And moreover, we could see that some parameters to consider for sample size in simulation analysis uh, that should be discussed. You can see them in, in the screen. And you, as you can see, there are a lot of elements that were discussed, taking into account if the nature of the analysis was supervised or unsupervised, and clusters, group variance, and effect size were ones of the topics that were generating more debate and that were more difficult to reach a consensus on. On the other side, on cohort design, a lot more recommendations were made. In concrete, 22 recommendations were made and those were classified according to the different stages of development of cohorts. And as we have done before, we'll go through just the more relevance of them. And in the experts' discussion, we could uh, agree that in personalized medicine, it's important to take into account the kind of target uh, that we want to study as, for example, it's not the same to uh, work with a cancer target or, for example, with a rare disease target. And it's also to imp important to consider which is the kind of treatment that we want to study, for example, if it's pharmacological or non-pharmacological, as then the uh, 
methods that we will need to use, we, for, for instance, will need to be uh, totally different. We also reach a consensus on that there is a lack of common approaches for that harmonization and integration, which are necessary if we want uh, to form large and heterogeneous data collections. And this no clear recommendations, there were no standard recommendations. And for example, there was an exception in that field in the multi-omics field where some specific techniques and sub-methods are or can be recommended. In general, there are a lot of gaps in regulation standards as uh, my colleagues will be presenting later. Uh, and for that reason, I will not be focusing on that on that specific area, but also regarding stratification and validation of cohorts, analysis of full risk of bias uh, are not often published. And there is a tendency to publish studies that actually work, so we can lead to publication bias. So we discussed um, greatly with experts, which were the consequences of this publication bias. So we can see, uh, for example, that it's not easy to reach a consensus on each and all the steps of the stratification and validation process, but we reach it a list of recommendations. We've gone through um, them uh, some of the most important of them, but the total list are 34 recommendations that were made regarding those two topics, and we've pointed some of them in the last minutes, but we are not in time to go through all of them. So we had those large lists, and we felt, as you may be feeling now, just like too many information, and we wanted to learn some useful work and that list, that long list of 34 recommendations, which is not in time to present you all of them, was not also useful uh, in our everyday work. So we decided to land all this list, all this long list in a shorter list of recommendations as a checklist in order that you could use it easily in your daily research. And you will be able to find this uh, list, this checklist in the permit website where you will be able to read all the recommendations regarding cohort design and sample size calculation. And we know that these presentations are short and intense, and for sure you still have lots of questions regarding the recommendations, as we have not been able to go through them all in detail. So if you are interested in these uh, recommendations or in this part of the project, you can scan the QR codes that are in your screen to be able to access to our complete work. And I think that time for questions and discussions will be at the end of all presentations. So don't hesitate in asking us. Uh, and thank you for your time and for being online. So, uh, Professor Sasso. Thank you. thank you, Julie. It's a very, very clear presentation. So I, I remind all participants to ask the questions in the chat because we will open the discussion after all presentations. But now it's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Enrico Glaba is assistant professor and senior research scientist in machine learning and bioinformatics at the University of Luxembourg. Enrico is also deputy course director for the Master in Integrated Systems Biology and principal investigator of the Biomedical Data Science Group. Uh, as a member of the research team in the National Center of Excellence in Research on Parkinson's Disease, he works on the subprojects data and analytics and the biomarkers and mechanisms. Uh, his research is centered around the development and application of software tools 
for the analysis of molecular, clinical, and neuroimaging data for comp complex diseases, in particular, the neurodegenerative diseases, uh, Parkinson and Alzheimer. Uh, key focus areas uh, cover the design of graph-based algorithm to identify disease-associated perturbation in cellular processes and molecular subnetworks, machine learning methods to discover robust discriminative features for uh, diagnostic biospecimen classification and approaches for network-guided candidate disease gene prioritization. Very interesting, uh, uh, Rico, the floor is yours. You are muted. You, you are on mute. Thank you very much. In this presentation, I would like to give you an overview on the computational analysis and modeling stage in personalized medicine projects and uh, the challenges that are involved and the recommendations that we have developed to address them. So the computational analysis and modeling stage comprises several difficult and challenging tasks, covering the data pre-processing, quality control, statistical and machine learning analysis, and the initial cross-validation analysis of the collected data for patient stratification. And so if you consider how this stage fits into an overall personalized medicine pipeline, I think it's important to note that preparations for this stage are already required very early during the study design. For example, to conduct a sample size calculation and define the analysis plan. During a project, the stage follows directly after the biological data collection. So when the raw experimental data has been collected and is ready for pre-processing. However, the computational analysis and modeling also precedes experimental data collection because this stage lays the ground for the experimental validation of a candidate biomarker model for stratification derived from the computational analysis. In the permit project, we have tried to identify the main gaps and challenges that can affect the computational data analysis in personalized medicine projects. So using discussions with domain experts and the comprehensive literature review. And so here you see a chronologically structured overview of the main challenges that we have identified. First, challenges can already occur in the study design and sample size selection, where many studies are underpowered or uh, imbalanced, involve imbalanced study groups or are affected by dropouts occurring later during the study. Secondly, for many data types, there's no agreement on the most suitable methods for data pre-processing, filtering, and normalization. And this often results in an inadequate choice of approaches and in a lack of suitable standards. Thirdly, the model building can uh, involve very uh, difficult challenges related to the algorithm selection, the choice of parameters, and the optimization. And so here, often the modeling approach is not suitable for the chosen input data, or model overfitting or underfitting occurs. Furthermore, there are challenges related to the optimization and calibrating of prediction models. In particular, due to biased parameter selections or a missing calibration step. An often missed opportunity is the integration of prior biological knowledge into prediction models. So here often relevant prior data from public biomedical databases is ignored or ineffective, ineffective data integration methods are used to exploit the prior data. Finally, apart from the model building, issues can also occur in the model assessment and the validation of models. So for example, this can occur due to inadequate evaluation methods and performance metrics, or a lack of robustness in the validation, for example, due to limited sample size. And, the, and when validating the model performance, cohort specific biases can affect the results and in unsuitable validation schemes can also lead to erroneous results. Finally, in personalized medicine projects, it's often very important and decisive to uh, obtain models that are fully explainable. So here we need to ensure the model interpretability and biological plausibility. But ho however, here, often many studies use uninterpretable black box models instead of interpretable and transparent so-called white box modeling approaches. 
To address these challenges, in the permit project, we have developed several dedicated recommendations as part of discussions with experts in working groups and to using a, a, a comprehensive literature review. And so we have structured these recommendations chronologically. And here you see the first main challenges that can occur in the planning phase. So in particular, some of the key main challenges include insufficient sample sizes and underpowered studies, imbalances in the study groups, and dropouts in longitudinal studies. And as key mitigation measures to address these challenges, we have devised a variety of recommendations that are outlined here on the right. So in particular, we suggest to always conduct a pilot study for prior sample size uh, estimation for every study that one conducts. Also, algorithmic biospecimen ma matching and sample selection methods should be used whenever this is feasible. And one should consider to integrate complementary biological data in the analysis to increase the statistical power. To address imbalances in the study groups, we always recommend to conduct a detailed prior plan for further subject recruitment and to address class imbalance already in the modeling stages, for example, using weighting or undersampling methods. Similarly, to address dropouts in longitudinal studies, we recommend a detailed prior plan for subject recruitment. And also here, dedicated methods to address dropouts in the modeling phase are available, for example, using bias checks. In general, one should always carefully consider possible causes of censoring with subject meta specialists to choose the most appropriate methods to address dropouts in the studies. In the discovery and modeling phase, some of the key challenges that can occur involve uh, yeah, both challenges related to the data preparation, for example, inadequate data pre-processing, filtering, and normalization methods, as well as challenges related to the modeling. For example, if the modeling approach is not suitable for the used measurement data or application, or if the model is overfitted or underfitted. Here we recommend to apply dedicated quality control analysis both before and after the data pre-processing to check the suitability of the pre-processing methods. Moreover, we suggest to assess the distribution assumptions behind the data using dedicated statistical tests and to apply pre-processing techniques that are tailored specifically to these observed distributions. Even if a suitable pre-processing approach has been identified, it's always suitable to compare multiple pre-processing approaches to identify the most adequate one. Similarly, to find the most suitable modeling approaches, we recommend to compare multiple modeling approaches, ideally using a rigorous nested cross-validation method. We also suggest to consider ensemble learning methods to integrate different uh, approaches as an alternative to relying only on single algorithms. And finally, to address model overfitting or underfitting, we suggest to use dedicated regularization methods and optimize the parameters using nested cross-validation. We also recommend to combine dimension reduction or filtering methods with subsequent learning algorithms uh, within a cross-validation to uh, re maximally reduce the risk of overfitting. Finally, in the validation phase, some of the key challenges that uh, can occur involve, for example, a lack of uh, robustness in the validation, which can be indicated by high variation in cross-validated performance estimates, but also problems related to the generalization capability of the models. So when the predictive model does not generalize across different cohorts and populations. And also, many models are often uninterpretable and cannot be explained in terms of a biological rationale behind the model. So to address these challenges, we recommend to consider both the discovery and validation study already early in the sample size estimation and to use robust bootstrapping or cross-validation techniques, for example, bolstered cross-validation and multiple relevant performance metrics to maximally increase the robustness and the stability of the performance estimates. To prevent that the predictive model does not generalize across different cohorts, we suggest to consider a dedicated meta-analysis of data sets from other cohorts for feature selection, or to plan an external validation on a distant cohort or population. And when interpretability and explainability are relevant study objectives, we suggest to use dedicated interpretable white box learning algorithms 
to ensure full explainability of the model. And here, the use of structured machine learning approaches guided by prior biological knowledge, for example, from cellular pathways and molecular networks, can really help to build more interpretable models. As a final example use case to illustrate some of these key recommendations, I would li just like to briefly mention a previous success story of a successfully clinically validated biomarker model, the so-called Allomap signature, which is used to predict the risk of heart transplant rejection. So the signature was developed as part of a multi-stage discovery, validation, and optimization process, which is illustrated here on the right. And a key characteristic involved a knowledge including sensitive RT-PCR validation and the statistically powered external testing to maximally increase the robustness of the validation. So we think that workshop results in, in This, I would like to thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to ask questions later in the discussion session. Thank you very much, Enrico. Very clear uh, presentation. So now we move uh, to the next uh, speaker, uh, Vibeke Fosse. She is a researcher at the Department of Clinical Science at the University of Bergen in Norway. And uh, um, Vibeke is a veterinary surgeon who holds a master's degree specialization in companion animal oncology. Since uh, 2016, she has been working with preclinical oncology research at the University of Bergen in Professor Emmett McCormack's research group, focusing on developing clinically relevant animal models for translation. So thank you, Viveke. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'll just see if I can get my screen up. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm uh, also presenting on behalf of my colleagues in Eatris, um, Emanuela and Florence, and Florence is in the audience and also available to answer questions later if necessary. So just to uh, introduce uh, translational medicine, <clears throat> it's sort of defined as uh, the process of turning observations in the laboratory clinic or community into interventions that improve the health of individuals and the public. So it can range from therapeutics and diagnostics to medical procedures and even behavioral medicine. Therefore, translational medicine is like a bridge between basic and clinical research. Uh, and it is a dynamic process. So you get research uh, both from bench to bedside and back again. So, um, the, in the, the um, PERMIT project, we've specifically looked at translational models for personalized medicine because the introduction of personalized medicine has manifested the need for robust and reliable preclinical models, which can generate accurate and predictive data. So this is meant to shift in translational research away from just a demonstration of efficacy towards developing more sophisticated preclinical models or a combination of models that can successfully discriminate between responders and non-responders for a given treatment and hopefully provide predictive data prior to therapeutic clinical trials. So Rita has already covered the methodology specifically um, in our um, part of the project. We have uh, conducted a scoping review um, looking at uh, both scientific publications and gray literature in relation to the translational steps of uh, personalized medicine research programs. We performed a gap analysis and examined these gaps through a series of consultations with a wide range of external experts in the different fields, specifically in vivo models, in vitro models, in silico models. Um, and um, then we had a consensus workshop 
uh, which uh, had the aim that we designed the framework for our uh, recommendations uh, and then uh, a sort of subset of the participants are co-authors uh, in a paper which hopefully will be published very soon. Uh, so I will now introduce um, the gaps that we um, identified and built these recommendations around in our um, re uh, literature review and gap analysis. So the first gap is that there is a lack of clinically relevant experimental models for personalized medicine in particular. And one of the reasons for this is partly that there are no direct requirements to demonstrate the relevance of a model, but it's also explained by the fact that modeling personalized medicine is extremely complex and there is a need for further technological advances in this area. The second gap we identified was the lack of standards for methods validation procedures and the lack of quality assessment systems. Preclinical pre models are often not robust enough for translation. And uh, uh, hurdles for model validation are that this type of work is not academically rewarded, it's time consuming and expensive. The third gap is the lack of accurate reporting and the lack of reporting of negative results, which then further leads to a lack of systematic reviews and meta-analysis on preclinical methods. And these are important tools for evidence-based medicine. There are reporting guidelines, but um, they're often not in compliance with the recommendations and the re academic reward system for publishing positive results, as well as competitive secrecy from industry means that negative findings are often not shared. The fourth gap we identified was relating to regulation and the lack of harmonized guidelines for evaluating the relevance and robustness of preclinical evidence. And the last gap is a lack of um, involvement and collaboration between preclinical and clinical research. And also there's a need for a better definition for patient engagement also at this level. So uh, departing from the gap analysis and the consensus reached through the consultation meetings, we have constructed a set of 15 recommendations for robust and reproducible research in personalized medicine. We've tried to illustrate them in this figure and it tries to capture the fact that these areas are all interconnected. So the recommendations are focused around the five main areas, namely clinically relevant translational research, robust model development, transparency and education, revised regulation, and interaction with clinical research and patient engagement. So uh, there must be an increased emphasis on using clinically relevant research models. And to achieve this, there should be standards for model relevance. The use of models in personalized medicine research should be, must be actually evidence-based. And because it is not realistic to be able to represent different patients in one model alone, one would need to use a combination of models. Secondly, research models must be robust to be predictive, and there should be a common implementation framework for rigorous research to provide reliable preclinical data prior to clinical trials. To achieve this, there is a need for specific policies and public funding. And in addition, further efforts should be made to standardize, qualify and adopt innovative technologies. Thirdly, transparency and education are vital. Transparent and reliable reporting and data sharing must be a requirement for both the academic and commercial sectors to improve the quality, credibility and responsiveness of research. Pre-registration of all animal study protocols and our in open access databases should be required by research funding bodies and or research organizations. And all stakeholders must ensure that the education and training of research promote methods for high quality and reproducible preclinical research. But to facilitate change, it is important that the regulatory framework is updated too. Regulators should ensure that preclinical evidence is clinically relevant and encourage incorporation of patient-derived models. Regulators and ethics committees reviewing and approving clinical trials should have harmonized guidelines and standards for evaluating preclinical evidence. And it's also important that the regulation facility 
and facilitates the incorporation of innovative preclinical methods in the drug development pipeline. Interaction with clinical research is very important. Active patient involvement in preclinical research should be facilitated and incentivized through public funders. The development and infrastructure of dedicated patient-focused interdisciplinary translational research centers should be supported by targeted funding. And lastly, and importantly, all relevant stakeholders in preclinical personalized medicine development should encourage and facilitate interdisciplinary interactions, both to address the causes of translational failure and to enhance the efforts to develop robust research models. So to conclude, the development and validation of robust and predictive preclinical models is challenging, but it is fundamental for further development of personalized approaches. And the recommendations that we have presented embrace the whole pipeline of developing personalized therapies. And we encourage an increased patient focus and more interdisciplinary collaborations in every step. The implementation of these recommendations will not be easy and it requires a cultural change in the preclinical research sector, but also from all key stakeholders that are involved in the translational step. With that, um, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and um, answer questions later. In thank the you. Session. Thank you, Vipeke. Very, very interesting presentation. So now, last but not least, we have uh, the final uh, presentation of the panel uh, by Raphael Porcher, uh, Professor of Biostatistics at the Université Paris-Cité in Paris, France. Uh, Raphael is a professor of biostatistics uh, and senior statistician at Hotel Dieu Hospital in Paris. He's also a member of the methods team of uh, CRES UMR 1153 Research Center and co-director of the Center Virchow Villermé in uh, Paris and Berlin. Uh, Raphael is an established investigator with expertise in uh, innovative uh, statistical methods for uh, causal inference and uh, personalized medicine and uh, has a PI or co-investigator, co uh, has been a PI and co-investigator of several nationally funded or European Union funded projects, such as Horizon Project. Uh, his research focuses on methods with the development of a new causal statistical approaches for PM guidance uh, with a mapping and a comparison of uh, potential designs and applications. For instance, in uh, chronic diseases such as a primary Sjogren syndrome. He, uh, he also has a long lasting experience in both the design and analysis of cancer trials and more generally statistical analysis of the outcomes of patients with cancer, incorporating the course of uh, evolution of their diseases. So thank you very much and the floor uh, is yours. Thank you very much, Luciano, for the kind introduction, and thanks for the invitation to that seminar and attending the seminar also. I try to be brief. Um, so <clears throat> perhaps you may know that there have been a lot of innovative trial designs that have been used for personalized medicine, mostly in cancer, but not only, but the examples I give here are all cancer trials, uh, and you may have heard of umbrella trials like the lung map study, basket trials as um, NCI matched or platform trials like iSpy2. And those raise a lot of methodological and statistical challenges like how to add a new arm to an ongoing clinical trial, how to cope with time trends and chronological bias, how to handle multiple uh, comparisons in these trials. And so, from one side, you have this very active field of research, uh, and on the other side, there was a lack of randomized trials that would compare the effectiveness or, or the added value of a personalized medicine versus a non-personalized medicine strategy. So, within the permit project for the last work package, we aimed at developing recommendations on how to design design trials for uh, personalized medicine and methods for uh, comparative effectiveness of a personalized medicine versus a non-personalized medicine approach. Um, you've already had a very good overview of the PERMIT 
process. So I, I can be brief on those. Uh, Rita and my colleagues have already explained you how we worked. So for this work package, we started as everyone by a scoping review. And then we had working sessions with experts of personalized medicine, two of those. Um, and then a, a bigger workshop with a larger group of stakeholders. Um, since at the end of the workshop, we still we are not sure about some recommendations. We 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 build we set up some focused groups with statisticians or HTA representatives, and at the end we had a collaborative validation of the recommendation. Uh, again, since time is relatively short, uh, I will not spend too much time on the scoping review, which is um, certainly interesting, but perhaps less operationable than. Um, recommendations. Just to tell you that the scoping review identified some gaps, gaps that might not be too severe, like the terminology using labeling the trial designs is very um, viable and not well set. Um, there are very few applications of the complex innovative trials designs outside the field uh, of oncology. There is very few guidance on which designs are best suited to tackle the most important challenges in personalized medicine. Uh, and the last gap was the, the lack of implementation of trials that would evaluate a personalized versus a non-personalized medicine strategy. So as a conclusion, there are many designs that exist for personalized medicine, but still more research would be needed to identify and report the pros and cons of those approaches. Uh, before going to the recommendations, uh, we had to narrow down or specify the the scope of the recommendations and one non, not not so easy question was what is a personalized medicine trial it looks like it's easy but actually personalized medicine is a very wide field and any trial within personalized medicine could be a personalized medicine trial and then it becomes very difficult to to, to have some recommendations if we look at the European Commission definition of personalized medicine, they talk about an integrated package of healthcare solutions that comprise elements of medicines and medical devices structured to meet an individual patient's need. This is an excellent definition, though uh, it's not sure that everyone doing personalized medicine uh, would use all those elements. So we, we retained a, an easier definition, perhaps, like we said that a personalized medicine trial would be a trial attempting to show that the effect of the intervention would depend on how individuals would be characterized. And we also needed to, to categorize a bit the, the broad domain. And then we differentiated between several situations or typologies for personalized medicine. One would be targeted medicine or precision medicine, which most of the cancer trials have done, for instance. A second one would, what we term stratified medicine, would be a situation where you have less evidence or less um, pharmacological knowledge of, of your markers, um, but you still want to, to do personalized medicine, but you, you don't have a targeted therapy. There is individualized medicine or even individualized treatments like CAR T cell therapy, which is again different. And then individualized medicine with dynamic regimes, like when you want to, to set up just-in-time adaptive interventions, which is again a, a different domain. And then we, we, we left this one a, a bit apart. Recommendations, um, we came up with 18 of those for trials applied to personalized medicine and trials to use to assess personalized medicine versus non-personalized strategy. And the recommendations can be broadly classified as general recommendations, topic specific, uh, reflecting to the four type typologies of personalized medicine I've presented before, or design specific. So for, for general recommendations, we, I have set up here the, the main recommendations, but they, they can look very straightforward. And the first one would be that for trial design, it's not because we are doing personalized medicine that we should forget the fundamental principles of clinical evidence generation. And there is no reason to, to have a different standards because it's personalized medicine compared to medicine in general. And this comprises uh, including control groups, preferably concurrent control groups and 
preferably allocated by randomization and receiving active comparators, preferably standard of care. Uh, the design should at best allow to show that the effect of the interventions depends on the individual characteristics or biomarker. Uh, and biomarkers or uh, algorithms used in personal medicine should have demonstrated external validity be before being used. The two last general recommendations are more for personalized versus non-personalized medicine. But the first recommendation, well, there is a non-recommendation we, we did, which is that there is no specific recommendation a, uh, possible for a design that any situation may warrant a different design. So, but it is important that the personalized medicine strategy should be compared to standard of care, including a non-personalized approach when it is the case or other uh, approach that could use some different form of personalization and that's using randomized controlled trials. Um, and trials comparing a personalized strategy to a non-personalized strategy should account for the whole personalization strategy and not just the last part. Uh, I will not have time to spend time on the topic specific recommendations, but you can find all those recommenda uh, recommendations on, on the permit website. Um, so we, we try to match the, the, the designs the, the type of trial that you have on the left on the table that were uh, found in the scoping review to the, the different types of personalized medicine or situations of personalized medicine. Um, so for instance, um, basket trials, basket of baskets or umbrella designs are very well su suited for targeted medicine, but have no specific uh, advantages or even more disadvantages for individualized treatments. Uh, and for stratified medicine, mostly the marker stratified design would be best or whenever possible, trial design that are able to separate within and between patient viabilities of, such as crossover trials. Um, but then umbrella trials might be very well suited. For design specific recommendations, we set up five recommendations, uh, some for basket and umbrella trials, but I, I will not spend too much time for that. If you have questions on basket umbrella trials, I'm very happy to, to answer at the end. And for platform trials, one thing is that for platform trials, it, it is important to think that often there is um, an ongoing control arm even, and then new treatment arms. And it's important to compare the patients to the concurrent controls and to avoid as much as possible to compare to, to the historical controls. Uh, and also platform trials should include a question for the marker negatives when you have a biomarker. Then I thank you very much for your attention. And I just take the opportunity of my last slide to heartfully thank all the participants to the different panels and scoping review and recommendation that uh, working groups that we have set up. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael. Uh, very interesting. So now I would like to ask uh, all the panelists to come back to the screen. Uh, we have about 20 minutes uh, now for discussion. And uh, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, there is a very interesting one from uh, Eli Karshenas, uh, who has been a speaker in a previous uh, webinar of the association. So Eli, if you can hear me, if you would like to come also to the screen, uh, we make this exception for you because, again, you've been a speaker before in the series. So if you would like to uh, just, you know, ask your questions uh, live, uh, that would be possible if you can hear me. Otherwise, I will read a question for you. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Ah, hello, you Ali. So you're there. Great. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sash. This was a wonderful, wonderful a uh, set of presentations that I thoroughly enjoyed. My name is Ali Karshanos. I'm uh, from West Virginia University uh, School of Medicine here in West Virginia. Uh, my question to the panel was that uh, relative to the technical and the structural size of the data collection and validation within the uh, framework of precision medicine, particularly when it comes to uh, understanding and comprehending uh, the nature of machine learning and AI algorithm designs and so forth, uh, there is not enough understanding within the framework of precision medicine on 
diversity in clinical trial participants. So what would be your recommendations in expanding the diversity, particularly in the areas of social determinants of health, that the design of these trials are very well scoped out? Thank you so much and wonderful job. Thank you, thank you, Ali. Who would like to start? We can have a round with a whole panel if you want, you know, to uh, respond to Ali. Jacques, would you like to start maybe? Yes, maybe I can start. I think the, the, the process we described here is a very generic process. So of course, uh, stratification in personalized medicine was based initially on uh, genetic uh, uh, data, on genomic data. Then uh, all the omics entered into the, the game, I would say, with the proteomic data, transcriptomic data, uh, with uh, metabolomic data and so on. But there are all the types of data that could also participate in the same, uh, in the same stratification, meaning that it's possible to include lifestyle data, environmental data, and so on. So the, the process is generic, and what we describe here can be applied to any sort of data. It's true that for the time being, most of the personalized medicine research is focusing on uh, classical omics, but uh, this may expand and take into account, uh, let's say, all the or the um, uh, determinant of uh, variability across individuals. Thank you, Jacques. Uh, other uh, comments from other panelists on this point? Enrico, probably. Yeah, please. Probably. Yes, so I think it's very important already in the study design to consider possible confounding factors and also, of course, uh, minority groups, whether they are sufficiently covered in the cohort. And I think here, um, even algorithmic approaches to assess confounding factors, to, so to assess different variables like uh, gender, like uh, uh, the, the representation of different ethnicities. So this can be actually supported by algorithms to make sure that the, the final cohort design really represents a well-balanced and also representative uh, um, uh, cohort for uh, the question that is to be addressed uh, in the study. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. Other um, comments or interventions, please uh, feel free to come in if you would like to. Right. Since Ali is here and yes. Ali had a question in the chat on rare diseases and that converators or standard of care are not good or effective. So um, the, the, the recommendation we have presented here are the, the rough version of the recommendations in that in the uh, document and paper um, we are of of course also more balanced saying that to some extent this is where what we should aim at and when it is possible we should not overlook those um, elements such as randomization uh, because they are important for HTA agencies for uh, and for the public, I guess, I think. Uh, but we acknowledge that sometimes it's not possible. Like it's difficult in very rare disease. It's difficult to evaluate, compare um, personalized medicine strategy to a non-personalized medicine strategy when actually the personalized medicine strategy is a targeted drug like m inhibitor inhibitor uh, for which targets 0.4% of your disease population. So there is no point doing a trial where only 0.4% of patients will change their treatment. But also even for rare diseases, I, to some extent, there has been a disregard of randomization saying that it's too complex, it's too costly, it's not a good idea, we could stop that. While in not every times, but in many situations, we, we could still think of randomizing um, very early in the drug development. Uh, once, when it's too late, then it might be non-ethical anymore. But but early on, it, it might be something that we 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 have to think. Um, okay, that that was the point I wanted to make. Um, thank you. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Paul uh, that was with us uh, in this webinar. Uh, thank you. He's leaving now. Uh, but he's really a um, very important person for the association. 
uh, former uh, president of Maastricht University and now is rector of Bochum University in Germany, uh, Professor Martin Paul. Uh, so other uh, comments or um, you know interventions on this point uh, from the panel? Okay, if not, I would like to ask again the participants, please ask in the chat very clear questions because some of them are not very clear. And also please do not forget to mention your name and affiliation. That is also important when you ask a question uh, so that we will address you know, the, the questions with names and affiliations, of course, in the chat. Do not use the QA uh, function. Uh, I have a question actually for the panel. Uh, it is amazing in my view, the complexity of this project really. I also have experience with European projects, but I can imagine that permit has been really complicated in terms of uh, different actors uh, really involved, uh, research infrastructures, experts, uh, uh, patient organizations, regulators, et cetera, et cetera. Can you um, again uh, elaborate a bit more on the management of this project, which were the challenges in uh, carrying on this project. Maybe we can start again with Jacques, and again, if there are other interventions, they will be welcome here. I must say, I have some experience in managing a European project. I think it was for me the, the sixth in the series. Uh, it was the easiest one. Clearly, yeah. it was the easiest one because, uh, or not, because I think the, so we had a very tr strong methodological support from Marion Egri, from uh, Rita. And I think also the consortium was just the uh, right size, meaning we had uh, the right spectrum of competencies. In fact, the consortium itself was not so big. There were 10, 12 participants. Then we had a certain circle of people who were external experts invited to participate in the, in the meeting, but without uh, having, uh, person months allocated so they were not uh, supposed to deliver but just to participate in the discussion and then there was a third circle of external experts that were invited on purpose for 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 for, for some some of the of the workshop but i i must say that uh, this project was rather straightforward what was difficult at the beginning is to share a common understanding and a common definition on personalized medicine because depending on whether you work in the field of cancer or in non-cancer, the, the, the methods are very different or are slightly different and the culture is different, the level of uh, experience is uh, different. <clears throat> but I must say that this was a rather straightforward project. Very, very nice to hear. Uh, other comments on, uh, on this point, any challenge that you faced uh, that you, you can also share with, uh, with some of us? Yes, uh, regions here. Um, I, I fully agree with the Jack. Um, uh, when we started this uh, project, uh, we uh, were really aware about the main challenges and the, the, the difficulties, but then the reality was, uh, it's not very common, but easier than expected because the group was really working smoothly. And even if we are all coming from different fields, uh, uh, we start very soon to speak a, a common language, which is very important in such a complex uh, project. So um, from the methodological point of view, the main difficulty uh, was to really try to find a, an approach that could work for uh, different, uh, different fields uh, from um, mice model to uh, clinical trials and uh, AI algorithms. So we try to balance uh, the rigidity of um, methods uh, uh, with uh, the flexibility of the, of the complex scenario we, we faced. But at the end, I think uh, this group was, uh, was successful in, in, in uh, uh, deliver what, uh, what the project was aimed to. So we were very, very satisfied. Thank you, Rita. Other comments um, on hey. this point? Yes, please. Also, I would just like to add that I think that the fact that this project um, kicked off in January 2020, so just at the start of the outbreak of the COVID pandemic, actually turned out to be an advantage in the end because everyone got so used to these digital meetings and the digital format, which meant that it was easier for us to have access to so many experts 
that I think we would it would have been more challenging if we were asking for in-person meetings, which was the original plan. Um, so, so that I think, and and then also from just my personal point of view, I think that uh, Paula, our project manager, who's not here today, um, ran this project extremely well, yeah. uh, and I think that's definitely one of the reasons for the success as well. Thank you, thank you. Another general question: We know that personalized medicine is not clear uh, as a concept yet in the society at large, but of course, uh, patients are really expecting huge developments in this uh, area. What was the role of the patients' organizations? Did you work well uh, with them? It was um, a very uh, good collaboration. Yes, I can say a few words. So we, we work with a patient representative. They were, they were very active since the, the beginning and they, they brought the patient vision. And this was true also for the HTA, meaning that we, we had uh, different partners in the project that were representative of the HTA bodies. And uh, their role was very important to, uh, to move the perspective of personalized medicine from the product perspective, meaning identifying a biomarker that will, uh, that will drive the decision to use a given treatment and to co-develop the, the, the treatment and the biomarker to another perspective, which is the perspective of patient-centered clinical research, meaning that uh, the, the, the idea is to, to, um, to raise the question, to address the question, what is the best treatment option for this patient or for this subgroup of patients? And this can be based on a new drug or on innovative drug, but also in drug uh, repurposing. And there is a lot of space for drug repurposing in the field of uh, personalized medicine. It's just a way to optimize the use of drugs that are already on the market you know, and to, to have this patient-centered perspective. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Then I have a, a, a difficult question maybe for, for you as a panelist. Uh, as you know, AAHCI is an American organization, and this webinar is under the umbrella of this uh, uh, organization, but also organized by, as I said, by uh, myself, Frank Rulli, Nicole Bender from the European office of the AAHCI. So can you uh, compare a bit the situation in Europe and in the U.S.? in terms of uh, personalized medicine, in terms of projects like PERMIT, how is the, uh, the situation in, uh, in the US or maybe in other areas of the world uh, in this field? So just one sentence from my side, but I want the other panelists also to, to, to give an answer. Um, the methods are in fact uh, universal. So the, the, there should not be any difference in the methodological standard on this side and the other side of the Atlantic and uh, in any other world uh, region. What is more regional is the regulatory context. So there are some methods that can be implemented in the US and not in Europe, but it's not to the, due to difference in the methodological standard. It is due to the, the difference in underpinning uh, regulation. And this is true for clinical trial regulation, for a cohort, uh, for, 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 for the, the, the oversight and uh, ethical approval of, of cohort uh, studies. But this is also linked to the, to the general data protection uh, regulation that makes uh, the secondary the secondary use of data in Europe a bit more difficult than it is on the, the other side of the Atlantic. Thank you, thank you, very, very interesting. Other comments uh, on this, any other? Um, okay, so we, just, we have a few minutes, unfortunately we need to close in about five or six minutes. So we'd like to ask uh, uh, each of you maybe to in one minute, maybe to uh, finalize, you know, with a, one uh, a final thought, uh, you know, your message to the audience, please. Again, maybe we start with Jacques and then we go in the same order of, uh, of the panelists. So one minute, uh, Jacques, maybe to conclude from your side this webinar. So I think we, we have to, this, um, this project, demonstrate that we have to, to be careful and not to consider personalized medicine as a hype. Um, personalized medicine should be considered very carefully with very robust method. And maybe there will be some 
personalized solution that will really become the standard of care. But I think uh, this cannot be uh, generalized uh, to any sort of treatment for any patient and any subgroup of patient in the, in the near future. And we have also to consider this is the role of the HTA. We have to consider the added value in terms of effectiveness and cost effectiveness of the personalized versus the non-personalized approach in uh, medical care. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Carita, please. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having us today. And my main message would be that uh, personalized medicine research uh, is not at all different from any other type of research, meaning that we uh, do have to apply the the well-developed standard we learned uh, from clinical research, preclinical research. Uh, we do have to apply uh, the fundamental um, aspects of uh, research integrity, such as transparency and sharing of the results. So uh, even if this uh, terminology is very fascinating sometimes, and in, in some cases is also misused to uh, sell something more than what it is. Uh, I, I think we learn uh, how to uh, translate uh, uh, the, the key milestone of research methodology also to personalized medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Enrico, please. Uh, sorry, Judith. Judith, <laughs> the order of the panels. Yes. Okay. Um... Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted also to join to my colleague's point of view uh, to Rita on to also what Jax has yet introduced. So first of all, thanking all the all the participants in the in the webinar this afternoon, and maybe my take home message would be quite similar to Rita's and Jack's, but I would like also to highlight that even that personalized medicine is trying to focus on the needed experience for each of the patients, we also need, it's necessary that we can find some uh, highlights or some common uh, approaches when trying to uh, conduct this type of studies, but we also need to personalize each of our studies. I mean, we have to focus on which are our objectives, which are our, uh, our populations of a study and not trying just to guide for the standards, but also trying to guide our research or conduct our research regarding which our uh, which are our main objectives. And I think that it's a little bit also one of the main conclusions of of our of our project and maybe my colleagues will will agree with me. And just uh, thank you for inviting us and for letting us be part of the panelists this afternoon. Thank you, Judith. Uh, Enrico, please. Yes, I would also like to thank the organizers of the webinar and all participants. And so for me, um, the key message would be that one, one of the main aspects of precise medicine projects is cross-disciplinary communication. So I think we have seen that there are both challenges on the experimental side, on the computational side, on the clinical side. And I think um, um, the key challenge, but also the key opportunity is to speak with each other, to, to uh, uh, go out to, to all the domain experts in the different areas and uh, cross the border to the other side, so to say, to speak with the experts, uh, even if the language uh, often is, is different and, and difficult uh, in terms of understanding each other. I think this is really the key challenge, but also the key opportunity <coughs> in these projects. Thank you, Rico. Uh, Vibeke? Yes, I would also just like to say thank you and, and that I agree with everything that has been said. And I would, I just saw there was a question about what is preclinical research. So I wanted just to say from my topic that it, this is laboratory research, you know, it's, it's not on patients but it's maybe on patient material. And, and I think the, the other thing that we found that is very similar between all the work packages and extremely important in the preclinical step is the fact that you need to, to validate and make sure that your methods are robust 
um, and um, and that that is something that we have seen not just with the kind of classical laboratory research and animal research and cells, but also in in terms of the computer modeling. So, Thank you, Rebecca. Well. Uh, Rafael, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will be short again. Uh, I'm. I cannot do anything else than joining Jacques and Rita in reinforcing that personalized medicine research or clinical trials are clinical trials bef before being personalized medicine. Like It's not because it's personalized medicine that we should do everything differently. Then that acknowledged, there are many, personalized medicine is not one domain. It's very wide. It's different types of questions, different types of objectives. So of course, uh, everything might be acceptable as soon as it's thought. So there is, again, a margin of improvement in terms of methodological research and regulatory research. Like what what do we want? What is the minimum level of evidence that we, we need? Um, is it possible to conciliate the difficulties, for instance, having small populations and difficulty to have randomized trials? with uh, um, supplementing that with cohort studies. Th there are a lot of questions that are still unanswered and it's moving field. So perhaps in five years, the, the permit two project, if it exists, will come up with different recommendations, but it's, so it's still a moving field. But but for now, I just, yeah, we, we, we should strive to, to think of what we should do best before of uh, where we want to go fast. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. So many thanks again to all of you, uh, dear panelists, for the excellent presentations. Many thanks to the participants who have been online. And also many thanks to everyone who made this webinar possible. I also want to thank especially uh, Paula Garcia from ECRIN. Uh, she could not be with us today, but she worked very hard for the preparation of this webinar. And of course, AAHCI, Christy Smith, uh, Efril uh, De Goma, and uh, also many thanks to Nicole Bender, the, the manager of the, of the European Office of the University of Zurich in Switzerland, and Frank Rulli, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine. So thank you very much and see you soon. Please stay tuned because uh, the Office in Europe of this association will organize other webinars in the near future. And also we are planning an in-person event in Zurich in September 2023. So see you soon and all the best and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.